about 40 here. So what the heck is the 4th of July holiday all about? What are we celebrating on the 4th of July? And so this is also known as Independence Day. So it goes back to the Declaration of Independence back to July 4, 1776, a Declaration of Independence that established the United States of America. The Founding Fathers signed off on this document, and by so doing, they were putting their lives on the line, right? If they had lost the war, everyone who signed off on this Declaration of Independence in all likelihood would have lost their heads. So they were, they were really risking something by signing off on this document. And perhaps the most famous part of the Declaration of Independence is right near the top. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. So what the heck does it mean all men are created equal? It just sounds like absolute nonsense. So the historian Peter Novak wrote in 1988, rarely have so many ambiguous terms and dubious propositions being compressed into such a brief passage. And this illustrates an important point that I use in my life. When you really want to understand something, you grant to, to the speaker or to the writer that there is, there is reality to what they're saying, and then you rack your mind to try to think, how could this possibly be true? So under what circumstances could we possibly believe that all men are created equal? Now, on the face of it, Right, th this declaration is nonsense, but uh, Peter Novak says it's salutary nonsense. Right? Belief in these self-evident truths has for more than 200 years provided one of the strongest bulwarks of liberty and equality in the United States. Uh, I'm dubious about that. I believe it's more the demographic composition of the United States. It's shared history and heritage, shared race and religion that has provided stability to the United States rather than uh, the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution. But uh, you can find reasons why in virtually any context to accept that some seemingly false statement is possibly true. You just have to want it bad enough. So if you really want to understand what someone's saying, you have to accept provisionally that what they are saying is true and then just start racking your mind for all the ways that it can possibly be true. Now, we have limited time, we have limited energy, so we frequently tend to dismiss people and ideas that sound crazy to us so that we can concentrate our very limited resources on the few people and the few ideas that do matter to us. But if you want to know how could this possibly be true that all men are created equal, here's an explanation from a Stanford historian. So when Thomas Jefferson wrote, all men are created equal in the preamble to the Declaration of Independence, he's not talking about individual equality. Right? What he really means is the American colonists as a people had the same rights of self-government as other peoples, and hence they too could declare independence, create a new government, and assume their separate and equal station among other nations. Now, after the American Revolution succeeded, Americans began reading the famous phrase another way. It now became a statement of individual equality that everyone and every member of a deprived group could claim for himself, and with each passing generation, our notion of who that statement covers has expanded. So it's now that promise of individual equality that has come to define our constitutional creed. But that's not how things started out, right? We, we started out with a very different understanding of all men are created equal. It was a collective understanding. Not all individuals are created equal. It's a collective understanding that all peoples ha have a right to assert themselves and to seek to create their own government, right? One of my favorite uh, popular historians is Brian McClenahan. He just released a video on Joe Biden's strange understanding of American history. I love being proven right all the time. All these people really aren't committed to any of these things. They only love the Supreme Court when it does what they want to do. They don't love the Supreme Court when it doesn't do what they want to do. They only love the Constitution when it does what it wants them to do. And they don't love it when it's not doing what they want to do. So in reality, what you have is just what Calhoun predicted in the 1850s, right? When he posthumously published both of his works on the Constitution. But of course, he was writing those when he was still alive uh, before that point. Uh, and that came out of his experiences in the 1830s and 40s. So you have essentially a situation in America today that was just like it was before the war. And why? Why do we have all these problems? This is the real question. Why do we keep having all of these issues? The Supreme Court does this. You need to ignore the Supreme Court, the Constitution, etc. Because we have two different constitutions working at all times. We have the unwritten Constitution, which is 
the incorrect constitution, and we have the written constitution, which is the one we should be following. But of course, if we had that constitution in place, the United States government wouldn't do most of what it does. So this is the issue. This is what Calhoun was talking about. And of course, he was saying what we need to do is have some teeth in the 10th Amendment, because if we don't have any teeth in the 10th Amendment, we'll keep having all of these issues. Now, let's talk about the Supreme Court. I'm actually going to focus on a piece that Jonathan Turley wrote. Because after the Supreme Court issued its most recent decision on affirmative action, the left went ballistic. They went ballistic. Because, in their mind, this is the only way that uh, we can have a diverse college environment. And that's really what it was about. But we're going to see this now, I think, extended out to other areas. Is affirmative action legal in, in any of these other areas? This was a very narrow ruling. It was focused primarily on colleges and universities and admission requirements. And it does still give colleges and universities wiggle room. We've seen that with Harvard. They issued a statement saying that, of course, you can talk about how if race was... So they did away with affirmative action in California. And I, what, what's interesting to me is how so many people are on the right are just willing to declare defeat. All right. There's a major victory by the U.S. Supreme Court declaring affirmative action on the basis of race illegal for college admissions, but so much of the right is ready to declare defeat, saying, oh, it's useless. The various educational bureaucracies will just find a way around it. And they will find ways around it, but it's still a significant ruling. In California, they forbade the use of affirmative action by race, and it has significantly reduced the number of low-achieving blacks and Latinos getting admittance to our top universities, public universities in California. Now, have the educational bureaucracies at UCLA and Berkeley found partial ways around this ban? Yes, partially, but we don't have nearly as many affirmative action by race students in the California public university system now as we would have without that uh, referendum declaring affirmative action by race illegal. And Affirmative action, like much of the rest of the civil rights agenda, it's, it's interesting how it's become progressively less popular as the years have gone by. So even minority groups, by and large, do not care for affirmative action. Support for affirmative action is largely limited to an elite. Like regular people don't like it. And when the Supreme Court rules against it, when California rules against it in a referendum, that has a significant effect on the real world. But <laughs> I notice with many conservatives, they're just so quick to say, oh, it's hopeless. Right, the, those darn elites, they're just so smart. They're going to figure out you know, a way around this. And there's absolutely nothing we can do to you know, overcome those gosh darn elites. Right? They, they've absolutely got us licked. What can, what can we possibly do? And another way that uh, many on the right are very quick to declare despair is saying, oh, it's just inevitable that we're going to be swamped by people from other regions of the world who are hostile to the historic American nation. And this is just baked into the demographics. There's nothing we can do about it. America's finished. America's over. Well, not true, right? This, this thinking is based on a Census Bureau error that leads Democrats and Republicans to assume that Democrats are simply on the right side of inexorable demographic trends. And yet, you see Republican massive successes in 2010, 2014, 2016, and even in 2020, Republicans did pretty well. In 2022, Republicans got the majority of the vote. So this whole majority-minority narrative is wrong, says sociologist Richard Alba, referring to the idea that non-white Americans will outnumber whites by 2050. So Richard Alba published a book, The Great Demographic Illusion. So he notes that how many quote-unquote non-whites are assimilating into the American mainstream just as many white ethnic groups did before them, and government statistics fail to account for this complex reality. So what the heck is going on here? So Richard Alba accepted these U.S. Census Bureau statistics and predictions at first, but Back in about 2016, he spotted a key error in how the Census Bureau classifies people by race and ethnicity. So the data understating the degree to which people are coming from mixed family backgrounds, often overwhelmingly white, but because they indicate on a Census Bureau form that they are part black or part Asian or part Latino, they are counted by the U.S. Census Bureau as 100% black, 100% Asian, 100% Latino, even if they may be majority white. So the Office of Management and Budget has decided, who carries out the U.S. Census, decided that Americans who designate themselves as white 
and something else on the census form are classified as non-white. So if I put in my census form that I was white and Chinese, right, I would be designated 100% as Asian. So if you're changing white to non-white, right, that bollocks up the statistics, right? Plenty of Americans of mixed Asian and white descent will have more contact with white relatives than with Asian ones because there are far more whites in America than Asians. So 62% of Asian whites feel very accepted by whites compared with 47% say they feel the same thing from Asians. When they marry, 72% of Asian white women and 64% of Asian white men take white spouses. Yet the government counts them and their progeny as non-white. So people who are willing to stake their lives, their activism, their career, their predictions, their understanding of reality, they're on statistics that are distorted and that they don't really understand how they are formulated. Let me get a little bit more here from Brian McClanahan. Uh, a, a block or some type of obstacle in your time as a young person and how, how you overcame that to achieve success. So in other words, I can just write that in their essay. And of course, that would still be part of their college admissions. And other schools have already been doing this. So it hasn't eliminated race entirely from a decision concerning college enrollment or admission. But it has made it to where you can't just say, all right, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. We're going to have you know, somebody of this group or that group, or we're going to use race as a deciding factor. Now, quotas have supposedly been illegal for years. In fact, in the Nixon administration, this was brought up. You know, we're going to have quotas when it comes to hiring or business practices or education. Those have been illegal for years. Now, we also know in many states, they've tried to restrict affirmative action, make it to where it's illegal in college admissions. But I think you're going to see more states go out and try to do this now, and at least eliminate it as a part of a process for admissions. Um, a colleague of mine asked me if I was still skeptical about the uh, the sweeping decisions of the Supreme Court, or at least it was going to do what it said it was going to do. And I had said from the beginning that I'm not so certain this court's going to do much. I was a little surprised by the Dobbs decision. These were kind of softballs in some ways, and I said they're kind of trimming around the edges because if you look at what's happening, they're still relying on a 14th Amendment interpretation of the Constitution. They're still relying on that second Constitution now, the, the Constitution that was uh, created in 1868, to, to uh, come up with these decisions. And until they get rid of that, you haven't really done Has 40 run out of Modafinil? No way, bro. I got like six months supply of, of Modafinil. And I've had two cups of coffee this morning. So that's very rare for me. So I'm all fired up to do this live stream. I think I've had one morning in the past six weeks that I can remember where I was able to sleep in past uh, 5 a.m. So I can remember one, one morning where I woke up at uh, 5, 10 a.m. Pretty much every other morning, I am wide awake by 3 a.m. So I'm uh, ready to go, ready to rock and roll. Now, another thing I notice in, in discourse, how conservatives love to talk about how America is a republic and Democrats love to talk about how the United States of America is a democracy. In reality, in the real world, there's very little functional real world difference between living in a republic and living in a democracy. So I put in republic versus democracy into Google. The first result is from a firefighter who posts a republic is a representative form of government that is ruled according to a charter or a constitution. Democracy is a government that's ruled according to the will of the majority. Yes, but there are no functioning democracies according to this definition. Uh, the main difference between a republic and a democracy is that the Constitution limits power in a republic, often to protect the individual's rights against the desires of the majority. And yet any right that you believe you have can be taken away in a state of emergency or by a decision of five U.S. Supreme Court justices. So another website, Diffen, D-I-F-F-E-N.com. Key difference between a democracy and a republic lies in the limits placed on government by the law. Both forms of government use a representational system. Citizens vote to elect politicians to represent their interests and to form a government. In a republic, a constitution protects certain inalienable rights that supposedly cannot be taken away by the government. But uh, this is more in theory than in fact. So most modern nations are democratic republics with a constitution. Not sure that's true. Not sure that most uh, modern nations are democratic republics. There, there are no pure democracies in the world today. So democracy and republic are frequently used to mean the same thing, a government in which the people vote for their leaders. But uh, yeah, Republicans love to talk about we're a republic, not a democracy. Not much functional difference. Right? So a republic is a government of laws, not of men. 
driving its authority not by divine right of inheritance or strength of arms, but by reason and by adherence to the mechanisms of the Constitution. Yeah, that's in theory. In practice, people, people in functioning democracies vote for their leaders, and then their leaders and leaders in the judicial system, such as the Supreme Court, then effectively decide what rights we get to enjoy. We've done anything substantial to change the way we're going to, we're going to interpret the Constitution, the way we're going to look at the Constitution. That faulty understanding of the 14th Amendment still is working in both directions. So we've got to get rid of that. So in my mind, they're still kind of trimming around the edges. He said, they're not. They're really doing things fundamental. And I would say that this is, uh, of course, a, a court that's been more active uh, in, than recent decades. But we know that, as he also pointed out, that other courts have been much more active. This court is not even as active as the Rehnquist Court, the Burger Court, or the Warren Court. I mean, those courts were much more active than this court. But of course, they were doing things that the left liked. Now, at the top of the show, I talked about how the left has a new foil, a new enemy. And it's not the court, even though they are critical of the court. And they're going to they're run on this, right? This is going to be a big campaign issue moving into 2024. We've got to do something about the court. But we have a new foil, though, and it's actually Jefferson Davis and the Confederacy. You see, because everything that happens now is because of Jefferson Davis and the Confederacy. I don't care if you're on the left or the right. This is how stupid American politics are. We have our American Hitler, and it's Jefferson Davis. For a long time, it was John C. Calhoun. Now we're going to Jefferson Davis, the Confederacy. I mean, everything that happens, it doesn't matter again. If you're on the left or the right, it's because of Jefferson Davis. Now, how do I, how do I say that? Well, you look at Victor Davis Hanson. Okay, so a lot of uh, conservatives like uh, Dennis Prager love to boast about how America, unlike other nations, right, this is, America is an idea, right? It's a place that where anyone can come and belong regardless of background. Unlike other nations that are based on shared heritage, shared history, shared race and religious ties, right? The United States is an idea. Now, there's a reason most countries are not multi-ethnic countries, right? And why most of those that have tried to become multi-ethnic countries have failed. This is from Christopher Cordwell's great book, The Age of Entitlement, where a shared heritage is absent or unrecognized as it is in the contemporary United States. All the eggs of national cohesion are placed in the basket of the Constitution, which is not a strong enough basket to maintain social cohesion. And with the dawn of the civil rights era, the U.S. Constitution, the very thing that supposedly made it possible for an ethnically varied nation to live together, not just came under stress, but was replaced by a new constitution, right? The, the civil rights constitution. So to whatever extent the United States today is a free country, and I, I'm fine with that, is a very different sense of freedom than it was between the administration of George Washington and that of John F. Kennedy. Right, so Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, 1954 Supreme Court ruling, unanimous Supreme Court decision that ordered the desegregation of all of America's schools. It's not just a landmark decision, but it was an unusual one. It was brief to the point of curtness, shorn of footnotes and case references. Each of its two parts ran about the length of a newspaper column. It was less a judicial argument than a judicial order. It was essentially an emotional expression, just like the Oberfell decision that uh, made gay marriage the rule of the land, right? You can't find a strong case for legislating same-sex marriage in the U.S. Constitution. But uh, justices had to make up a ruling, and they couldn't find precedent, so they just emoted. So with Brown versus the Board of Education, U.S. Supreme Court justices ignored, ignored the subject to which they devoted most of their deliberations, whether the 14th Amendment, right, drafted in the wake of the Civil War to guarantee equal protection of the law, was intended to permit segregated schools. Instead, they asked whether the doctrine of separate but equal used to justify school segregation was possible in practice. Of course, it is possible in practice. So the justices believed it was possible. And they did f note findings that uh, black and white schools had been equalized. They nonetheless repudiated the separate but equal doctrine for primary schools on the grounds that because of intangible considerations, right, considerations that did not actually exist in reality, but that they imagined existed, and qualities which are incapable of objective measurement. Okay, qualities which are incapable of objective measurement are not a sound basis for revoking the United States Constitution and replacing it with a new civil rights constitution. And the most ardent opponents of segregation were troubled by this U.S. Supreme Court decision to essentially rewrite the U.S. Constitution on the authority of vague pronouncement about the way things are usually interpreted. So one Harvard Law professor described Brown as an opinion which is often read with less fidelity by those who praise it than by those by whom it is condemned, right? Which is the most abstruse way of saying that uh, the Supreme Court decision was quite wrongly decided. 
So Brown would have been impossible under any faithful reading of what the drafters of the 14th Amendment had meant by equality, just like uh, Roe v. Wade, right, was decided on the basis of supposedly a constitutional right to privacy, but this constitutional right to privacy underpinning Roe v. Wade has not been found in any other subsequent important Supreme Court decisions, all right? It was just made up to fit the case of Roe v. Wade. So the heart of the matter with segregation was not equality, but the conflicts it created with the First Amendment right of freedom of association. And these conflicts are not easily solved. We have diminished freedom of association and freedom of private property to enact this vast you know, civil rights industrial complex. So if freedom of association is denied by segregation, integration forces an association upon those for whom it is unpleasant or repugnant. So we have a situation where the state must choose between denying the association to those who wish it and imposing it on those who would avoid it, all on the basis of these made-up principles that supposedly the Constitution demands. So in constitutional terms, the Brown versus Board of Education decision was arbitrary and open-ended. It essentially gave the U.S. government the authority to put all sorts of public bodies under surveillance for racism. The damage it aimed to amend consisted of intangible considerations. So there's no limit to this government surveillance, and that's the civil rights industrial complex that we live under today. Right? Once the Civil Rights Act was introduced into the private sector, this assumption that all separation was prima facie evidence of inequality and racism uh, this battle against desegregation implied a revocation of the old freedom of association. So within a decade of Brown versus Board of Education, philosopher Leo Strauss was warning that attempts to root out discrimination could backfire. He points out the difficulties under which minorities operate. In a liberal society stands or fall by the distinction between the political and society, by the distinction between the public and the private. And now we have the civil rights industrial complex regulating the most private of interactions. So prohibiting every type of discrimination essentially means the abolition of privacy, right? You want to fight for privacy, you're concerned about privacy, then you should be appalled by civil rights legislation, right? It is meant the, the destruction of liberal society. It's meant the destruction of privacy. It's meant the destruction of freedom of association. It's meant this considerable diminishment of the right to private property. So one University of Chicago First Amendment scholar tried to disguise his own misgivings about this ruling as praise. So he says one of the most distinctive features of the Black Revolution has been its military assault on the Constitution via the strategy of systematic litigation. Right? We have destroyed the old Constitution via this strategy of systematic litigation. Right? There's, there's no waiting for the random and mysterious processes by which Controversies are finally brought to the U.S. Supreme Court. Now there is a marshalling of cases, a creation of cases, a timing of litigation, a force feeding of legal growth. Right? You could say this is a brilliant use of democratic legal processes. Its successes are spectacular. But uh, it, it's also a strategy to trap democracy in its own decencies. So civil rights era has been a constitutional catastrophe. It's been a military assault on the Constitution. Like, how could you say that as praise? Now, what upstanding political actor takes advantage of another's decencies to entrap him? But that is what happened. So many U.S. Supreme Court cases that have paved the way for the civil rights industrial complex have not arisen naturally out of our country's ordinary social frictions, but they are created by interested activist parties. So the whole tradition of judicial review seems to lose its legitimacy. So we have the staging of court cases, and that's become a standard strategy for activist litigators in a way that until the 1960s was considered judicial corruption. So take the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. They not only stage events, they script them, it handpicks their plaintiffs, such as Rosa Parks. So we're taught in Black History Month that Rosa Parks was some tired seamstress who just needed to rest her weary legs in the white section of a Montgomery, Alabama city bus. And it was just all a spontaneous protest, but it was considerably more than that. So five months before the Montgomery bus boycott began, she attended a school in training social agitators. Right? She was an organizer of considerable 
sophistication, one of the intellectual leaders of the Montgomery NAACP. And you look at the American right, so to speak, particularly the West Coast Rousians, the Claremont people, everything bad is because of the South, Jefferson Davis, John C. Calhoun, the Confederacy, whatever it is. It's, that's the bad guys. And those were all Democrats. This is Mark Levin. Those were all Democrats, you see. All these guys, all this Jefferson Davis, all Democrats. The Republicans were always the good guys. Then if you're on the left, then if you're on the left, well, the GOP is just a party of neo-Confederates, right? It's just Jefferson Davis. We're just resurrecting Jefferson Davis in the Confederacy. And I talked about that last week. There's two pieces. One saying the same thing. So when both agree on this, and both have come up with the position that the bad guys are the same thing, and the good guys, Abraham Lincoln, we're doomed. This is where I'm pointed out with Miles Smith and his piece that we need to keep Lincolnian nationalism around. This is what we have now. It's not doing anything but creating more and more division. Why? Because we're, we have a fundamental misunderstanding about what the United States was and is. If you have a Lincolnian nationalism, Lincolnian America, you get what we have. You get exactly what we have today in American politics. And it's awful. A real American, a real understanding of the American tradition would include a heavy dose of federalism where the states would do this anyway. The Dobbs decision simply returned the issue to the states where it belonged. And we've seen states make up their own mind on these things now. And generally, the whole thing is quieted down. Why? Because in many states, everything stayed the same. And the states have then reflected the political culture of the people in those states. That's how things have worked. And you know what? I don't hear a whole lot of rumbling about this anymore. It's gone. The issue is gone. Now, I know on the left, they're going to try to say we need to have some type of legislation, uh, you know, codifying Roe v. Wade at a national level. And the same thing on the right. They, they, people have talked about that. But that was defeated. Republicans could never get that through. The left might try, but I think it would also be knocked down there as well. I think that they wouldn't have enough. The, the, the House and the Senate are going to be too closely divided right now for this. But regardless, uh, that's gone. Now, if some of these, if we get Democrats in the executive office for the next 12 years and some of these Supreme Court justices retire or die, and they start swinging the court back the other way, you'll see a challenge. Somebody will challenge uh, a state that uh, you know has restrictive abortion requirements, and it'll go to the Supreme Court again. And maybe they'll re overturn Dobbs. Maybe they'll say, no, no, no. There's a so this is the, the sad thing about all of this. The 14th Amendment is the issue. And until we can wrestle with that and come up with a way to get rid of that, we're going to be in this nonstop, uh, you know, this, this perpetual angst over the Supreme Court doing X, Y, and Z. It's been a nightmare. This, this is the nightmare that, that the Jeffersonians worried about with the Supreme Court. It's the nightmare that Calhoun worried about. So let me get into this Jonathan Turley piece because he says some things here that are rather interesting. Uh, the title is Biden's Normal. The president's constitutional takes are becoming more unhinged from history. Well, I agree. I mean, they've never really been hinged in history at all. <laughs> they've never been grounded in history at all. None of it has. So he says, the decision of the Supreme Court to end the use of race in college admissions was not unexpected. Indeed, the rulings in cases involving Harvard and the University of North Carolina ended decades of muddled five to four decisions. Yet President Joe Biden seemed to go into full attack mode and actually claimed that the court gutted the constitutional guarantee that all men and women are created equal. And declaring that this court was not normal, Biden further insisted that these admissions decisions of the Dobbs abortion decision reverse the gains we fought a war over in 1860 secure. So again, see, people ask why the war is still important because we're still fighting the war. The, the war is ongoing because we're in a third reconstruction and people are open about it, right? This is Eric Foner's point that the second American revolution would And you have the convenient foil. Everything bad is the Confederacy. This, I mean, look, you, Biden... So when I listen to liberal, centrist, conventional conservatives, they often talk about increasing rights as though it just moves in one direction. But whenever you increase rights for one group, you are taking away rights for another group. So adding civil rights for all Americans significantly reduced rights to freedom of association and freedom of use of your private property for the majority. And Christopher Cordwell makes this point in his excellent book, The Age of Entitlement, right? Rights cannot simply be added to a social contract without changing it. To establish new liberties is always to extinguish other liberties. So back in 1963, long before the pas passage of the 64 Civil Rights Act, those who were skeptical of civil rights legislation hinted that you know, some hypothetical old widow who rented out a home, a room in her house, right, might be you know, bearing the brunt of federal surveillance and law enforcement if she's too picky about who she accepts as a border. Now, civil rights legislation's backers treated the question as ridiculous, but the skeptics of civil rights were absolutely true. And people who are pushing civil rights eventually admitted that real freedom requires many changes in the nation's political and social philosophy and institutions. We must destroy the notion that Mrs. Murphy's property rights the right to humiliate me because of the color of my skin. So a border or a prospective customer is free to reject a landlord or a business on the basis of anything, including race and religion, but operators of a you know, rental property or operators of a business 
are no longer free to reject prospective customers for any reason. So the sanctity of private property has come to take second place to the sanctity of the human personality. That's how the pro-civil rights people put it. So after the Civil Rights Act of 1964, property simply does not enjoy the same constitutional protection it had before, nor does freedom of association. So Florida's segregationist governor of the 1960s, Ferris Bryan, described this brilliantly. He says, we would all agree that the traveler is and should be free not to buy. He can pass a hotel because he does not like the town, because he does not like the color, he does not like the name. He can stop and go in, and when he sees the owner, he can decide he doesn't like him because he doesn't like his mustache or his accent or his prices or his race or his other customers. He can turn around and he can walk out for any reason or no reason at all. Why not? He's a free man. Well, so too should the owner of a property be free. If the traveler is free not to buy because he doesn't like the owner's mustache, accent, prices, race, other customers, or for any reason, the owner of the property ought to have the same freedom. That's simple justice. So what exactly did the majority population think that they were getting with civil rights? Right? The majority population in America thought that they were being generous. But for black Americans, they essentially saw civil rights legislation as blacks, as white people pleading guilty in the court of history of being just perfidious and racist and awful. And so too, when the majority population talks about extending reparations to black Americans, that's not going to increase comity, goodwill between blacks and whites, or just give large numbers of black Americans even more reason to believe that you know, whites are pleading guilty and that they deserve to be despoiled. So what's going on in our big cities? We're having a massive upsurge in violence over the past couple of years. They're erupting out of Philadelphia, claiming the lives of five people and injuring two children. But it's just the latest violence plaguing cities this July 4th weekend. We'll have a live report on that next. OK, I'll keep an eye here on oh. Fox. If anything interesting comes up. Let me catch my breath, please. Victor Davis Hanson could have said this stuff. Well, what we're doing now is fighting a war over uh, what we fought a war over in 1860. Mark Levin, what we're doing is fighting a war. We fought a war over this in 1860. This is how stupid all this stuff is. When you have the same common hero and your same foil, doesn't matter if you're on the left or the right, is the Confederacy. Well, what does that say? There's no difference between the two. Just in degrees. In an interview with MSNBC's Deadline, White House, President Biden accused the court of ignoring, quote, what the Constitution says. We hold these truths to be self-evident. <laughs> all men and women are created equal and died by the Creator. Now, that's funny. That's really funny. So that's what the Constitution says. We hold these truths to be something that all men and women... Now, see, first of all, that comes from the Declaration, but there's no women in the Declaration either. What Biden has done here is conveniently list the proposition nation myth. Well, who else does this? The West Coast Trousians, the Mark Levins, they all do it. The proposition nation myth is at the core of what's going on with America in terms of how we problematically view American government. You see, for one group, when we ended slavery and uh, we had Plessy v. Ferguson, we stopped there. Right. We're, we undid, undid Plessy v. Ferguson, excuse me. When we, when we had Brown v. Board of Education, undid Plessy v. Ferguson. We stopped there. That's it. The revolution's complete. We had the war. Uh, that ended slavery. And then we did our job with Brown v. Board of Education. Stop. Full stop. To the left, that's just part of it. That's That didn't do enough. Okay, this guy doesn't go far back enough. By accepting Brown versus the Board of Education, he completely overturned the American Constitution. So, no, we shouldn't accept Brown versus the Board of Education. People should have the right to freedom of association. There's become this really popular idea over the past uh, 50 years that America is primarily an idea. And that is not how America was founded. It was founded as the product of uh, people fleeing the United Kingdom to set up a nation created for their own benefit and the benefit of their progeny. So about 80, 85% of America's white population at the time of the Revolutionary War, towards the end of the 18th century, came from the United Kingdom. So it was kind of, the United States was created as an extension of the freedom of the rights of Englishmen, you know, shifted westward into the new world. So to me, America is not primarily an idea. It's where I live. America is exceptional to me because this is where I live, to quote Steve Saylor. It's a nation state founded by people who formed it in their own interests and in the interests of their progeny. America is not primarily a product of the Constitution, just like the Jewish people are not primarily a product of the Torah. Right? The Constitution is primarily the product of a particular people, 
operating under selection pressure in a particular environment. So even if you subscribe to the traditional notion that God gave every word of the Torah to the Jewish people at Mount Sinai about 3,200 years ago, right, that did not create the Jewish people as we know it. Because if God had given every letter of the Torah to another people, the Torah tradition and the nation associated with that would have developed very differently from the one that we have. Like Jews brought their own proclivities, their own gifts to God's Torah, just as Africans and the Japanese and Norwegians have brought their own proclivities and their own gifts to God's Christianity, if you believe that Christianity came from God. And they have transformed Christianity from the version that developed in the Middle East nearly 2,000 years ago. So what counts as Christianity in Africa today is completely different from Christianity as it's practiced in England or Australia or Iceland or Peru or Mexico. And if you want to just take a naturalistic understanding, religion emerges out of culture, and culture emerges out of the interaction between genes and environment operating under Darwinian selection pressure. So the West Coast Straussians are saying, well, we, we finished it. We completed this drive from the proposition nation. We, 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 we solved the problem. No, you didn't. Left say, no, you didn't. You didn't go far enough. Well, yes, we did. No, we didn't. So see, this is the issue. We've got the, we've got the Girondins and the sans culotte, right? I mean, we, we've gotten to that point in this American French Revolution. The West Coast Straussians are uh, the Dantonists, right? They're just saying we've, the revolution's gotten far enough. And then, then the, the Committee of Public Safety is saying, off with your head. Suspect and the victims. And conservatives. The gun long been left behind. Opening fire that would be the foil. That would be Jefferson block. Davis and John C. Calhoun. All they're, they're left behind. You see. And it wasn't about race with these people. That's a convenient thing. But in reality, what, what Calhoun and Davis and the South, and of course, there are many of these people in the North too. In fact, the real key to understanding the war is the Northern Democrats. All these conservatives in the United States in the 1860s were pointing out that what we're going to get is this nonsense if we keep this Lincolnian process going. That's what we're fighting against. We're fighting to keep the Federal Republic. We're fighting against centralization, extreme nationalization, all of that. That's what we're fighting against. So Rustin Shackelford says in the chat, even if I, what I'm, I'm saying is true, what is going to change the thoughts of the elites? Well, let's take the thoughts of the elites in Germany. Right? Prior to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the thoughts of the elites in Germany were overwhelmingly pacifist. <laughs> pacifist. <laughs> That's a combination of fascism and pacifism. Uh, They're overwhelmingly pacifist and very pro-green, pro-environmentalist. Then once Russia invades Ukraine, the Greens, who were the most left-wing major party in Germany, they became the most militarist party in Germany. They were willing to trash all sorts of environmental protections to pursue more energy independence for Germany and for Germany to take a leading role in fighting back against Russia in Ukraine. So why did elite thinking change in Germany? Well, the situation changed. So too in the United States. When the situation changes, elite thinking will change. So that which cannot continue will not. Right? So we're on an unsustainable path in many ways, such as in our rollback of policing and sentencing of bad guys. Right? Due to the surge in crime, many you know, people on the left are unhappy with the massive surge in crime. And so there is going to be blowback towards more law enforcement and towards longer prison sentences as situations change. So too, elite thinking will change, just as we witnessed in Germany. Question from the chat, 40, did you ever consider studying law when you were young? Not really. I guess a little bit when I was age 11, but uh, from about age 17 or 18 on, I wanted to study economics when I got to university. So Turley says, this is actually a reference to the Declaration of Independence, but it was the substance of the point that was so baffling. Interlocutor says, Germany is completely subordinate to the U.S. Yes, that is true, but it's also true that German elites changed their thinking. So how did German elites so radically change their thinking in the course of a month, right? In the course of the first month of the Russian invasion of Ukraine? They changed their thinking because the situation changed. So too, American elites will change their thinking when the situation changes, when, say, crime rates become unbearable to them, or America is in much greater peril. So the more peril the United States is in, particularly from uh, outside forces, the more people will tend towards an anti-outgroup attitude, which will tend to redound to the benefit of Republicans. The more safe, the more secure 
Americans feel, the more likely they will be to vote for the Party of Social Welfare, the Democrats. So whoever wins the election in 2024, that will largely depend upon the situation. If Americans' primary concerns are threats from outgroups, then Republicans should be in a good position to win. If Americans' primary concern is increasing social welfare spending, then Democrats will be a better place to win. The Constitution says... now. Again, Biden confuses. How can we expect these idiots on Twitter and Facebook or wherever social media to really know? This is like Hitler built the Berlin Wall. The Constitution says this. I mean, this is how stupid these people really are. But how can we expect anyone to know when the president of the United States just bumbles on about this kind of stuff? And uh, Luke Croft says the Germans still did not change their energy policy. They're still anti-nuclear nutcases. Well, they did change their energy policy in, in many ways. They shifted towards much more use of uh, natural gas. Uh, Chad says... Germans are still occupied by the U.S. military, so that helped change their elites' minds. Well, Germany and, and Europe, right, ha have not been willing to pay the price for developing their own military independence, right? They have taken the bargain of essentially outsourcing their military protection needs to the United States so that they could afford massive amounts of social welfare spending. And, of course, what he did here was conveniently insert the Seneca Falls Declaration of Sentiments, into the Declaration. So he's, he's confused the Constitution, the Declaration, and the Seneca Falls Convention. Three different historical documents, all confused now. We've got this hybrid thing that's working now, and Biden's an idiot. And Rustin Shackelford says there's something unique to the U.S. Elites will easily isolate themselves from situations that would change minds. Uh, really? So think about how support for the invasion of Afghanistan in 2001 and for Iraq in 2003 was overwhelming. Right. That was because of change of situation after 9-11, so that very few people were willing to stand up and oppose these invasions, even though they proved to be absolutely disastrous for the United States. So elite opinion did change. Right. Prior to 9-11, there was much more skepticism about nation building and getting more deeply involved in the Middle East. After 9-11, that became a foreign policy establishment consensus, became a media elite consensus, it became a talking heads consensus that, yeah, going into Afghanistan and Iraq is the right thing to do. It was absolutely wrong, but you did see a massive change in elite consensus. So elites still want to lead. Elites still want to have influence. They don't want to seem out of touch. And as the situation changed in America after 9-11, you know, elite opinions changed. It for all this stuff, but the left believes this stuff too. I, I guarantee you, if you polled a bunch of these leftist dopes walking around who vote and have children, that uh, they would uh, they would say that Biden actually cited the, the Declaration. I wrote these truths all men and women. There's nothing in there about that, but they would maybe think that. So Turley says, in barring the use of race and admissions, the court believed that it was protecting that bearing guarantee. The race with the court viewed as a glaring anomaly in, this, in its cases in the treatment of racial discrimination in education as opposed to employment. It was like the capstone opinion of for Chief Justice John Roberts, who in 2017 declared the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discrimination on the basis of race. In 2006, Roberts added, it is a sort of business that's divvying up, us up by race. So this was, I mean, Turley's pointing out, this is a long time coming. Right? This was going to happen. They were going to go and, and overturn this. They were going to so what did uh, white people think they were getting when they supported massive civil rights legislation? What about Serbia and Bosnia, different side of the same coin? Well, the United States was able to in intervene in the Serbia-Bosnia conflict without losing a single American. Uh, that was a time in the mid-1990s when the United States was the, the superpower in the world. So now that there are two other superpowers aside from the United States, Russia and China, the U.S. has to be much more selective about its use of, of power. But when you're the sole superpower, you can afford... You know, much more room for doing dumb things and intervening in things where there's no vital national security interests. So much of the reason the United States did so many stupid things between 1995 and, say, 2010 is because we were the, the world's uh, sole superpower. But now we live in a more dangerous world. American power is not as dominant as it was during that time period. Right, let's look at the chat. You talk as if this was a choice on the part of European elites. It was the outcome of World War II when Europe was destroyed, divided, and occupied by the U.S. and the Soviets. So according to Interlocutor 1067, Europeans are just an occupied power. They have no agency. But uh, if the United States told the prime minister of Germany to go suck off a dog, he would go suck off a dog because, hey, an American told him to do so. 
And uh, if any American comes along and tells a European to go suck off a dog, the uh, European is absolutely helpless. He must go out and suck off dogs because that's what the American said, that Europeans are just, you know, absolutely hopeless. They have no agency. I'm not sure why so many people on the right are just so eager to believe in their lack of agency and that if you know, some American or some Jew comes along and tells them something, they're absolutely hopeless in the face of that instruction. Uh, yes, the German prime minister would. Germans are self-hating cowards. I, I don't believe they are. They have created a fantastic economy that is now paying a huge price for the war in Ukraine. But uh, Germany's you know, created an economically dominant state over the past 70 years. Now they're facing some very grim demographics. They've you know, always lived in a very dangerous part of the world. Germany does not have naturally defensible borders. I think Germany, by and large, has done pretty much the best it could in a very difficult uh, situation. So what did uh, white people think they were getting with uh, civil rights, right? I don't think they suspected they'd see the vast increase in government oversight that's become the sine qua non of civil rights. So if you look at the congressional debate leading to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, it's just filled with outright mockery of those who warned that hitherto unimaginable federal government infringement is going to take place, not just the regulation of Mrs. Murphy's rooming house, but also mandatory school busing, public and private hiring quotas and immigration quotas. So you had this Florida Democratic senator who was worried that attempts to equalize school enrollment might lead to busing. His Pennsylvania Republican colleague just scoffed at him. Does the senator not agree that there is nothing whatever in the bill which relates to school busing? But by the 1970s, there was race-based school busing nationwide, not just in southern states. So all sorts of constitutionalist and libertarian fears, fears that were laughed at, chuckled at, poo-pooed by pro-civil rights legislators all came to pass. Those who opposed civil rights legislation have proved far wiser about its consequences than those who sponsored such legislation. And overturn the use of race in college admissions, at least overtly right now you can do it covertly you can do it in an essay but overtly you can't do it anymore the court was enforcing what it saw as the, as the self-evident guarantee referenced in the declaration and later protected in the 14th amendment you see this is where i told my colleagues they're trimming around the edges they haven't subs uh, subs uh, substantially excuse me raked out what needs to be raked out and gutted in the interpretation so it's still the 14th amendment it's still the declaration we're still going on the proposition nation we're just basing all of these things on all these judges are west coast Straussians. when you start from that position you open the door to the left to undo the position what needed to happen, what Thomas points out in his, his, his concurring opinion in Dobbs, was that, wait a second here, if we're going to say this about Roe v. Wade, what about all these other things that uses the 14th Amendment? We can't do that. The court reaffirmed that all men and women are created equal and will be treated equally in both education and employment. So it reaffirms the proposition nation. I mean, you could say that that's, but this is what the left is saying the goal is too. They would say affirmative action is treating everyone equal because these people have disadvantages and that these people have privileges. And so those privileges, this is not equality. It's all about this term equality. This is Harry Jaffa. This is the Harry Jaffa nightmare. Equality is conservative. It's not. They shouldn't, have, they shouldn't have argued it in this direction. They should have said, well, this is not really a federal issue at all. It's not a 14th Amendment issue. And you know what? The states can decide to do this however they would like. That would have been it. But no. They doubled down on the 14th Amendment in the proposition nation myth nightmare. So people who supported civil rights and white people in general who supported civil rights, they thought that uh, black Americans would respond with nothing but gratitude. They thought, oh, blacks... They just want to be nothing more than to be full Americans with the rights of all Americans. But that's not how it turned out, right? So giving blacks access to the rights of all Americans with civil rights legislation essentially meant redefining the rights that the majority of Americans had taken for granted, starting with freedom of association. So the United States was at its most united, most cohesive prior to civil rights legislation. But for black Americans, Americans' celebration of pluralism among Europeans had become a mockery. So pluralism, you would think, would mean a limitation of government power. You'd think it'd mean a free hand for private and voluntary organizations to develop their own patterns of worship, their own patterns of education, of social life, of neighborhood concentration and distinct economic activity. All of these enhance the life of these groups. But from the perspective of black Americans, all of these activities were exclusive and discriminatory. So all strongly identifying in-groups 
you're going to have suspicions and hostility to outsiders. But uh, strong in-group identity gives you know everyone in it a dignified place in the social order and its way of keeping the ruthless machinery of the market competition at bay. But the force of civil rights demands meant that uh, no sub-community, no in-group, because it either protects privileges or creates inequalities, has the right to exist. Right? Civil rights legislation was a war on freedom of association, which is a war on in-group identity. And now government set about destroying these sub-communities, all in the name of diversity. So the mainstream white assessment of the race problem in America in the 1960s you know, proved to be wrong. Whites knew a lot less about black people than black people did about white people. So blacks saw civil rights much more clearly than white people. You know, black people saw civil rights legislation meant that whites as a group had entered a guilty plea in the court of history and thus had to repudiate you know, their good name, the good name of America, and the good conscience of their constitutional republic. So did white people confer civil rights, or did blacks wring them out of a reluctant political system? Probably it was both. But uh, civil rights largely came from a revamped understanding of human rights, which became a left-wing cause in the 1960s and 70s, given that uh, socialism and practical politics had you know, failed to achieve much of what the left wing desired. So starting in the early 1960s, along with civil rights, you got this astonishing spike in crime in which blacks made up a disproportionate share of both perpetrators and victims. So you had the looting episodes in Memphis that preceded the assassination of Martin Luther King. You had deadly riots following that. You had the Los Angeles Rodney King riots, riots after O.J. Simpson's acquittal. A little bit more here from Brian McClanahan. The president is not alone in such hyperbole. Figures like Whoopi Goldberg, who cares, actually asked whether the decision means that we are heading to no women in colleges soon. Who knows? Oh, yeah, that's where it's going, Whoopi, when women now make up, uh, I think, 60% of people in college. College students. In some cases, it's higher. In some places, it's more. Yeah, that's where we're heading. So... American majority thought that uh, civil rights would normalize American culture and cure the paranoia of the South's racial imagination, but instead wound up nationalizing Southerners' obsession with race and violence and crime. And whoopee. When men are getting out of schools at high rates, college, they're going, they're going and doing something else. We actually do know, Charlie says, an opinion rejecting the use of racial classification to determine who goes to college could not be read by anyone as endorsing the exclusion of other groups. Well, that's true. I mean, Charlie's correct about this. This is about race, not about sex. But the fact is, uh, this is just complete a complete joke when someone like that says that. That's fear tactics. That's scaremongering. You know, it's 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 saying things that are never going to happen. In fact, because women now control so much of higher education, this isn't going to happen. The truly baffling statement was Biden's claim of the Civil War. By leaving questions like abortion to the states, Biden claimed the court was reversing what was gained in that war. The criticism it came in response to an opinion insisting that the place, there's no place for racial discrimination in higher education. That would hardly seem an argument that would be embraced by the Confederacy. Oh, also, the North. <laughs> uh, because we know, even after the 14th Amendment was ratified, that Washington, D.C. had segregated public schools. So if it was aimed at ending segregation, that would have been news to the people that wrote the amendment, or at least ratified it, or put it into effect. In fact, Thad Stevens, as I've talked about on the show, Thad Stevens uh, saying that, well, I mean, this doesn't do anything that you think it's going to do. It's very narrow, the 14th Amendment. It simply, it simply codifies the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which was designed to ensure that former slaves had access to courts and could own property. And that was it. Very narrow interpret, very narrow agenda for the 14th Amendment. But we've expanded that out way out. Right? And that's because people like Eric Foner and others, Randy Barnett, have said the 14th Amendment is expansive and Barnett's on the right. So when you've got Eric Foner and Randy Barnett in agreement, now you're arguing over the how far you should take it is the issue. So civil rights... <laughs> advocates, they, they never talked about the need for affirmative action, right? So when you got initially the Civil Rights Act of 1964, that was then followed to the surprise of much of the country by the decision that legal equality was now insufficient, that uh, civil rights movement did not disband once its ostensible demands were met. It grew into a permanent powerful lobby, a political bloc, seeking to remedy the problem of lack of jobs, lack of money, lack of housing 
and the federal government made it now a central part of its mission to procure those things for blacks and trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars were spent to try to secure these things for blacks and the results were disappointing on almost every front because the United States people had never signed up for such a wide-ranging project. Now, it's not that Americans were opposed to black advancement. They were surprised that black advancement slowed after the passage of Civil Rights Act. Right, so black Americans have been doing pretty well between the end of World War II and 1964. Now, after the passage of civil rights legislation, it slowed down. So Alan Bloom wrote in his 1987 bestseller, The Closing of the American Mind, that blacks proved as indigestible in university systems as they had been in earlier generations. So he was a professor at Cornell University in upstate New York when black radicals bearing assault rifles rousted visiting parents out of bed on a parents' weekend in 1969, demanded concessions from the university administration, which were granted. So Bloom left for the University of Toronto, and he saw that the indigestibility and the radicalism were two sides of the same coin because Cornell had admitted a large number of students who were manifestly unqualified and unprepared to do serious university work. Therefore, it faced an inevitable choice, fail most of them or pass them without their having learned anything. So black power, which hit the universities like a tidal wave, provided a third wave. So whites were looking for excuses for black underachievement and they said, well, we, we must have, you know, imaginary systemic racism. And to overcome that, we now need affirmative action. And the Civil Rights Act allowed the government to compel affirmative action, to order the hiring of black people or any other equitable relief as the court deems appropriate. And it became nothing neutral about the new system. Right? The, the judges who interpreted it explicitly repudiated race-neutral solutions. The American anti-racist regime excluded the most obvious race-blind solution to prejudice, such as neutral civil service, college admission, and hiring exams. So in Griggs versus Duke Power Company, Supreme Court ruled that uh, objective tests, if they disadvantaged blacks in any way, they could not be used. Good intent, absence of discriminatory intent, does not redeem employment procedures or testing mechanisms that are operated as built-in headwinds for minority groups. So if different groups have different gifts, then you can no longer use objective tests which reflect those differences. But of course, the Confederacy is, the, you know, this is the foil, right? This is the foil. But it also would be an argument that would hardly be embraced by the United States in 1865 or 1866 or 1867 or 1868. You don't need to foil the Confederacy. Just, you want to say it's what Americans would have said in the 1860s overall. I mean, that would have been a better argument. President Biden has long taken liberties with our constitutional history. Many of us have repeatedly objected to claims that he has made in areas like the Second Amendment. One of the most respected lines is, repeated lines, I'm sorry, not respected, but repeated lines, is that the Second Amendment was passed with the understanding that certain guns would be banned and adding you can't, couldn't buy a cannon. When in, fact the sec when, in fact, the Second Amendment passed. That happens to be utterly false, which is true. You could buy cannons. In fact, you could do whatever you wanted. You could buy whatever kind of firearm you wanted up until really the middle of the 20th century. You go back to mail order catalogs. You could buy howitzers. You could buy whatever you wanted. Uh, and, and even during the war, the 1860s, you had private citizens building naval vessels with cannons. Yet even after the Washington... So after civil rights legislation, government now has the ability to disrupt and steer private interactions interactions that have been considered private out of the sphere of government until now. So being a businessman or a landlord or a mem member of a college admission board, all right, your, your freedom was completely reduced, right? All sorts of matters of personal discretion were now matters for government intervention. So this is all to fight racism, but the government was now authorized to act against racism, even if there's no evidence of any specific racist intent or racist behavior. So this is an opening to arbitrary government power. And once arbitrary power is conferred, it doesn't matter much what it's conferred for. And so you have growing skepticism about civil rights spreading widely in the American public. So Commentary Magazine commissioned Harvard political scientist James Q. Wilson, a native Californian, to write a guide to Reagan country in 1966 when Ronald Reagan was elected governor of California. And Wilson wrote, I do not intend here to write an apology for Reagan. Even if I thought like that, which I don't, I would never write it down anywhere my colleagues at Harvard might read it. Read it. <laughs> so intellectuals seldom wrote that honestly at the time. 
Half a decade later, his Harvard colleague Nathan Glazer wrote, Members of white ethnic groups say, We worked hard. We suffered from discrimination. We made it. Why don't they? And Blacks retort, You came after us. We were nevertheless favored above us, given all the breaks, both when we were in slavery and ever since. It's a question that cannot be asked without arousing emotions so strong that one wonders just how far scholarship will be allowed to go in this issue. And one of the first casualties in the affirmative action regime was truth. Right At the simplest level, affirmative action meant discarding prevailing notions of neutrality to instead redistribute educational employment opportunities on the basis of race. So affirmative action requires the use of race as a socially significant category of perception representation, which is race consciousness, which isn't that uh, racism. So half a decade into the civil rights revolution, America had something it never before had at the federal level, an explicit system of racial preferences, which is not how the civil rights movement was sold. Post declares Biden understanding of the Second Amendment to be false. He has continued to make the same false assertion over and over again. Yeah, of course, because if you say a lie long enough and you say it loud enough, people will, people will believe it. Now Biden has moved on to the Civil War, and his revisionism is about as subtle as Sherman's scorched march to the sea. The Civil War did not end federalism or states' rights. It denied the right of states to secede and ultimately fulfilled the pledge to equality first made in the Declaration of Independence. So there we have the proposition nation. This is kind of, you know, Miles Smith saying it didn't end federalism or states' rights. This is that Lincoln didn't end these things. Well, it did. Ultimately, it did. If you can't leave, you don't really have federalism. If you can't use the mechanism of the Constitution to protect a state, you don't really have federalism anymore. And it was just a matter of time. You're saying that it didn't end federalism when the Congress actually booted states out of the Union, created military districts, said you can't do X, Y, and Z? Of course it ended federalism. Oh, but, whoa, whoa, wait, 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 wait. We had federalism after that. We did, until the court, using this expansive understanding of the 14th Amendment, which, by the way, came at the end of the war, that states really don't have any powers anymore, that we can overrule them, we have a federal negative of state laws, what do you think happened? And, of course, this proposition nation? That would have been news to the founding generation and how this would work. One can have good faith disagreements on whether the use of racial criteria is constitutional affirmative action or unconstitutional racial discrimination. However, Biden is belittling our prior struggles for equality with these sweeping and erroneous claims. In his interview, the president also insisted that one has to look at how it's ruled on a number of issues that are have been precedent for 50, 60 years sometimes, and that's what I meant by not normal. In reality, the court's decision on affirmative action in education has been muddled and conflicted for decades. In 1977, in regents of the University of California v. Baki, the court barred affirmative action in higher education. However, it allowed some consideration of race as part of holistic, a holistic admissions process. In the decades that followed, the court remained sharply divided. By 2003, the court was ready to issue the very decision that it issued this week. However, in Grutter v. Bollinger, then Justice Sandra Day O'Connor supplied the fifth vote to uphold the use of race by the University of Michigan. Yet O'Connor wrote the court expects that 25 years from now. The okay, let's get uh, some Brian McClanahan on the constitutional crisis that of that 1776. That is the key to all of this. The American War for Independence was a constitutional revolt. And so let me get into that today, because I think this is the key to understanding the entire situation leading up to independence in 1776. And not just that, understanding the U.S. constitutional structure, because we've had two constitutions for the general government. One is the Articles of Confederation. The other is a constitution for the United States. And it is the constitution for the United States. And that's very important because that's what it says in the text. We often say it's the United States Constitution. No, it's the constitution for the United States. So we have these two constitutions for the general government. Of course, we have all these state constitutions, too. But the important thing to understand about the entire lead up to the war in the 10 years that preceded the war, and then the period after the war, and of course, putting the Declaration within context as well. And I'm going to talk about that in Thursday's podcast. And is the Declaration the key to understanding American government? I'm going to say yes and no, but I'm going to talk about a book that has to deal with that. So it's the key to understanding all of these things, this relationship between the British crown and the parliament and the colonies, is the key to understanding our entire federal structure in America. And there's a particular book that focuses on this issue, and it's entitled The Constitutional Origins of the American Revolution. And it's written by the eminent historian Jack Green. He's a great colonial historian. And this book was actually published by Cambridge University Press. Uh, you can get it in paperback form. Um, it's not very old. I can't remember the exact publication date. Let me look on it here. It's, it was published in 2011, so not that long ago, about six years ago now. But it is an excellent book, and I think one of the best for really getting to the heart of what was going on here in 1776 and 1775 and in the year. Okay, there's a terrific new book out about the British origins of the American Constitution. Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness Review, America's British Creed. The Declaration of Independence marked America's rejection of England's hegemony, even while the new nation claimed ideals that were born in London. By Dominic Green. June 30, 2023, 11.41 a.m. Eastern Time. The youth of the American Republic is one of its oldest traditions. Its unique origins will always make it younger than any other nation. Yet the United States is also the world's oldest democracy. 
Britain in the time of George III was a liberal monarchy, but Britain democratized only by degrees in the 19th century. France was neither liberal nor democratic before the Revolution of 1789, and the French are now on their fifth republic. The American ideal of democratic self-governance looks ever more exceptional as it creaks toward its 250th birthday. Britain has a kind of old-fashioned pseudo-constitution, an accumulation of legal precedent and patchwork legislation, standing on unwritten assumptions and topped by a hollow crown. Americans were the first to spell out their social contract and specify the rights of individuals in plain English. But what did the magic words of the Declaration of Independence, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness mean to their authors? History is best written by the losers. In Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness, Britain and the American Dream, Peter Moore, a historian who teaches at Oxford, shows how Britain exported its highest ideals to the Americans who rejected it. Mr. Moore breaks the American creed into three sections and examines each in context. Life explores how Benjamin Franklin embodied colonial intellectual potential in the 1740s and how he developed in London in the 1750s and 1760s. Liberty shows how the London rabbler Sir John Wilkes catalyzed the politics of liberty in the 1760s and why he resonated so loudly in the colonies. Happiness explains what the Enlightenment blend of action and emotion meant in England in the early 1770s and how Americans understood it on the cusp of their reinvention. Bible reading made colonial Americans perhaps the most literate population on the planet, but the life of the American mind was rooted in London. In 1740, Philadelphia was the colony's leading city, with a modern street grid and a handy location on the post road between Boston and Charleston, but its population of 10,000 was half that of Bristol in England. London's coffeehouse culture, and periodicals such as Addison and Steele's short-lived Spectator, were the templates for Benjamin Franklin's self-improving Junto Book Club, his Pennsylvania Gazette, and the almanac that he published under the pseudonym Richard Saunders. All American roads led to London and back. A London printer, William Strahan, supplied British news for the Pennsylvania Gazette. Strahan's protege, David Hall, emigrated to Philadelphia and worked in Franklin's print shop. In 1747, Franklin retired from trade, passed the shop to Hall, and commissioned his coming-out portrait as a gentleman. Franklin's scientific studies were not just an expression of practical polymathy. England's aristocracy of the mind were fascinated by science. When Franklin went to London in the 1750s, his electrical speculations were his calling card. Meanwhile in London, Strahan was printing Samuel Johnson's dictionary in installments. Johnson was writing his own one-man periodical, The Rambler. Franklin launched Johnson in America, publishing excerpts in Poor Richard's Almanac. Though Strahan linked the leading minds of American and British letters, Franklin and Johnson's division of perspectives anticipated the parting of imperial ways. Franklin presented himself carefully, playing the gentleman in Philadelphia for his London correspondence, just as he would later play the noble savage for Parisian admirers during the American Revolution. Johnson was a tick-ridden social bumbler. Franklin was irreligious but believed in progress. Johnson, a prayerful Anglican, thought that all change is of itself an evil. Mr. Moore describes their differences in the 1750s as liberalism against conservatism, but neither of those terms existed in those happy days before everyone had an ideology. The only word that made the king and his ministers sit up and think hard about America, Mr. Moore writes, was France, and that made the colonists want more of Britain than less of it. The Seven Years' War, 1756 to 1763, brought London and the colonists together, but the subsequent tax burden demonstrated how unequal the relationship was. Americans began to sour on the distant mother country, especially after George III and his ministers tried to ruin John Wilkes. Wilkes was a radical journalist, a defender of free speech, a well-connected Whig parliamentarian, and possibly the ugliest man in England. In 1763, George III demanded his trial for libeling the prime minister. Wilkes won his case, raised the ante by issuing a pornographic and blasphemous poem, and then skipped the country. He returned, won a seat in Parliament, and was imprisoned in 1768. The London mob cried Wilkes and Liberty, and rioted. The army, in a prequel to the Boston Massacre, fired into the crowd. The Wilkes saga helped convince the colonists that George III wanted absolute tyranny. The continuities with modern populism are obvious. 
In 2016, just after the British had voted to leave the European Union, I asked Nigel Farage, one of the architects of Brexit, to name his political hero. His answer was not Churchill or Thatcher but Wilkes. Likewise, Donald Trump's rhetoric of deep state conspiracies echoes that of the Sons of Liberty. No wonder the French see modern British and American politics as an Anglo-Saxon continuum, just as it was when Franklin first set sail for London. Liberty was the single word uniting freeborn Britons including those in the Americas. Liberty, like the British state, was patriotic and Protestant. Whigs invoked its origins in the Magna Carta, the Anglican Church, the Glorious Revolution of 1688, and the Bill of Rights passed by Parliament in 1689. As Voltaire saw when he fled to London in the 1720s, liberty was simply the English way of life. Freeborn Britons knew liberty when they saw its enemy, the monarchical despotism and religious obscurantism of popery, exemplified by France. Londoners, Daniel Defoe wrote, were stout fellows that would spend their last drop of blood against popery, that do not know whether it be a man or horse. The same went in the colonies. The apprentices of Boston held an anti-Catholic revel on November 5th every year, Pope's Day, which the British still celebrate as Guy Fawkes Day. When the Quebec Act of 1774 legalized Catholicism in Canada, the Congress called this decision impolitic, unjust and cruel, as well as unconstitutional. As late as 1826, Thomas Jefferson Dog whistled that the Declaration had burst the chains of monkish ignorance and superstition. Mr. Moore does not mention the religious origins of secular liberty, the anti-Catholic bigotry that was then considered progressive, or the British Whigs' distrust of Protestant enthusiasm, which they considered a kind of democratic dynamite. Without this context, we cannot understand what liberty meant to Wilkes and Franklin, why the Okay, so as far as uh, anti-Catholic bigotry, if uh, anti-Catholic bigotry enables you to have a more cohesive nation because you're united around a different religious approach, right, then you are more cohesive, you have higher social trust, life will be better for most people. So sometimes bigotry is adaptive. Now, there are other times in a multicultural situation where uh, bigotry may prove to be maladaptive, all right? You don't want to walk around filled with rage against outgroups if you're working amongst outgroups. If uh, your neighbors are members of outgroups, you want to have the best possible relations you can with, with people in general. But antipathy towards outgroups is an inevitable part of in-group identity. You also don't want to lack an in-group identity. So it's kind of a fine road that you need to walk to be effective in life. But there certainly is a time and a place for bigotry, right? If that increases your in-group identity, and creates a more cohesive and trusting society, then you're being served by your you know, bigotry against Catholics or your bigotry against you know, whatever outgroup you name. Now, as far as the regime of King George III being a tyranny, the American president today has all the same foreign policy powers as King George III had. An right? American president today can you know, go to war with any nation, can you know, send off nuclear weapons, can assassinate anyone who's not an American citizen. So to be a functioning democracy, you have to have considerable elements of dictatorship. And uh, the United States has considerable elements of dictatorship, as we saw during COVID, when all sorts of rights that we just took for granted were you know, just disappeared overnight. Right Back to this terrific book by Christopher Cordwell, The Age of Entitlement talks about the civil rights model of executive orders of litigation of court-ordered redress became the basis in American life for resolving every question, pitting you know, some new idea of fairness and equity against old traditions, right? The persistence of different roles for men and women, you know, different roles for different groups with different gifts, you know, the, the moral standing of homosexuality, the welcome that is due to immigrants, the considerations befitting the wheelchair-bound, so civil rights has turned into a license for the government to do what the Constitution would not previously have permitted. So civil rights moved beyond the context of Jim Crow laws almost immediately and became the dominant Constitution and dispensation in America. So this new political style was very well designed for destroying traditional institutions, not so much for building new ones. So Jamaican-born and Harvard sociologist Orlando Patterson enthused in the early 1970s that uh, civil rights represents an awesome opportunity. Black Americans can be the first group in the history of mankind to transcend the confines and grip of a cultural heritage. They can become the most modern of all peoples, 
people who feel no need for a nation, for a past, for a particular culture, but whose style of life will be a rational and continually changing adaptation to the exigencies of survival at the highest possible level of existence. So the next great cultural advance of humanity will mean the rejection of tradition and particularism. Well, that's not how civil rights was sold. It's not a life that most Americans want. Right? Civil rights was sold as just a toolbox of reform measures to remedy one heinous constitutional exception of Jim Crow laws in the South. So Americans thought the civil rights would be limited to Jim Crow laws. Right? They would not have consented to it otherwise. But Orlando Patterson was one of the few who understood there were no logical grounds for limiting civil rights to desegregation. And Yale University law professor Robert Bork saw that immigrant rights, children's rights, gay rights, the rights of the aged were not explicitly in civil rights legislation, but they could be easily induced from it. So the civil rights movement became a template, became a new system for overthrowing the traditions that hindered black people, and it became the model for overthrowing every tradition in American life, starting but not ending with the different roles for men and women. Years preceding that, 1764 to 1775, that 11 year crisis that took place in the American colonies. And it wasn't just in the American colonies where this was going on. It was also in places like Bermuda and Ireland. This was the way that, um, that British colonists looked at the British imperial system. So first and foremost, how did that system work or how was it supposed to work? Now, you start seeing British colonies, of course, in the Americas with the founding of Jamestown in 1607. And I talked about that on the last podcast, the, the story of the sea venture and resupplying Jamestown. But uh, Jamestown was the first permanent English colony in, in British North America, but they also had other colonial interests in the Caribbean. Of course, you had Ireland, which originally was a British colony. And so this imperial structure is being formed in the 17th and then into the 18th century. How did the central authority, meaning the parliament in London and the king, deal with the colonies? And then how did the colonies view themselves in relation to the parliament and the king? So when you look at Jamestown and you look at Plymouth or any of the other 13, we'll just, we'll just focus on British North America. We're not going to bring in the other colonies, but they all, they all viewed things this way. So when you look at these 13 colonies and how they were established, many of them were established as proprietary colonies, meaning that the uh, crown essentially gave a proprietary company, a, a, you know, a, a private enterprise, land, or at least a charter for land in the New World. And this company went out and they footed the entire bill. And they also appointed the directors and the governors and these type of things because that was, under, that was how the system worked. These were proprietary colonies. Now, you did have royal colonies. Royal colonies are where the king would then appoint the governor. And the way the system worked is that these proprietary colonies, almost all of them, would become royal colonies by the time we got to independence in 1776. So the king would have direct control of the colonies. And essentially, that's how the colonists looked at the structure. They actually, at one point, the reason they appealed to the kings because they viewed themselves as part of the king's domain. Right? This was the royal domain. Parliament had no control over it. So that's one part of the American war for independence that's often missed. One of the reasons why the colonists believed that Parliament was acting unjustly or unconstitutionally is because they thought Parliament really had no control over the colonies because they weren't represented. In okay, so a dramatic expansion of civil rights was into the relations between men and women. And uh, traditional mores rep recognizing that you know, men and women had different gifts and they should you know, be afforded different indulgences. Uh, that came under attack from civil rights legislation. So Christopher Cordwell has great insight into this. Here's just a paragraph. You can call sexual morality a mythology constructed by life-hating prudes, but they too serve an erotic function. Right? Without some kind of external source of sexual morality, such as from God, from religion, from tradition, people who would behave in a civilized way must produce their own prudery, their own sexual discipline and restraint and carry it around inside of them. So men must demasculinize, women must defeminize, which is you know, a result of civil rights. So Ray Davies of the Kinks wrote in his 1970s song about the glut of sensual gratifications often to a rock star, I got so many women that I wished I wasn't a man. So hypersexualization becomes a mask worn by desexualized. What is thrilling, fulfilling and functional about sexuality might be wrapped up in the very complexes about sexuality that can crusaders for sexual freedom and other reformers want to get rid of. So the liberal left wants to get rid of these traditional hierarchies, you know, traditional differences in roles between men and women, between you know, aristocrats and proles, between different groups. They want to get rid of hierarchies around Things like sexual purity, work ethic, religious affiliation, family pedigree, ethnic bona fides. And they want a new status hierarchy of liberalism rooted in cognitive elitism and kind of centered around a morality 
that distinguishes between those who are aware, those who are woke, and those who are not, those who possess the psychic maturity to accede to liberalism, and those who lack it and must be reformed, must be educated, must be bullied. So even people on the left have a great desire to dismiss the vast majority of humanity as absolute rubbish or, or trash, just unenlightened people who need to be you know, bullied into becoming uh, fit for society. So conservatives see this liberal perspective as just another elaborate facade for a status hierarchy that uh, puts liberals on top. The liberals think that, hey, thinking people, you know, the educated, the, the thoughtful, the disciplined, those who see themselves as having, you know, overcome traditional folkways and outdated traditions who have a particularly disciplined and reflexive understanding of themselves and their behavior, surely these are the people who should lead. And these are the badges of honor that are conferred on liberals and withheld from non-liberals. And because the liberal left has a near monopoly on the means of cultural reproduction, right, their own kind of identity politics just pass under the radar screen. It's camouflaged in this aura of hard-nosed utilitarianism. Right? This is Ronnie Goodman in his terrific work in progress, Conservative Claims of Cultural Oppression on the Nature and Origins of Conservophobia. But conservatives believe that they can see through this camouflage and they can see through the threat represented by liberalism to denigrate not only conservative thought, but conservatives themselves. So perhaps by nature, many conservatives are placid, compliant, and respectful. Most conservatives see themselves as civil, patriotic Americans who simply want to be left alone with their families and with their guns and with their religion. So conservatives are left speechless and stupefied by the never-ending onslaught of personal attacks, lies, and name-calling that the left rains down on them. So conservatives who are aware of this cultural oppression are united in a conviction that liberalism's rational facade conceals what is a campaign of psychological warfare, whose purpose is to undermine the self-confidence, conservative culture, and supplant it with a liberal culture. So that's why you get this profound incongruity between the good-natured innocuousness of ordinary conservatives and the venomous vitriol to which liberals would subject them. So let's get a little Brian McClenahan here on the 1776 uh, project. Let's talk about the topic of the day, which is the 1776 project. So the 1619 project, which I addressed uh, in a previous episode, has now spawned the 1776 project. This is the quote unquote conservative reaction to the 1619 project. So it was bound to happen. I mean, the, the 1619 project, for all the bad things about it, I will say this it has been an important watershed in at least popular history. I mean, it started a discussion that I don't personally think needed to be had, um, but it has. Um, and so you can say at least positive for the people that were involved in that. They've done what they what they sought out to do, which is get people talking about their work. I did it one time. I also wrote a piece for Chronicles magazine for it because I was asked. But I think the project would just go away if people would ignore it. Now, unfortunately, it's also the goal of the project is also to get the, the 1619 project to get the material into school curriculum. So that's where it could be problematic um, overall long term. But of course, the 1776 project has now been produced, and the goal of it, as it says in this piece I'm going to read about it, is a nonpartisan black-led response to the 1619 Project initi initiative. Excuse me. So this is a quote-unquote nonpartisan. Now, you see, here is the problem with all of this. The 1619 Project is partisan. It's influenced by political ideas. It's influenced by a reading of history. So is the 1776 Project. It's also partisan and influenced by a particular reading of history. There isn't any objective history. It's a myth. And I've talked about that on this podcast as well. There is no objective history. It does not exist. The problem with history is that most people don't admit their biases up front. So by the 1776 Project saying this is nonpartisan, this is objective. No, it's not. It's not at all. You have an agenda. You're trying to refute the 1619 Project. It's based on your understanding of history and your reading of it, which is a Lincolnian reading of history. Um, so that's your perspective. You are being colored by your understanding of history. The same thing with the 1619 Project. These people have an agenda. It's based on their understanding of what they've read in history, their worldview, which is victimhood. And so they're going to write a series of essays based on victimhood. It's simple as that. The problem is we don't admit this stuff up front. Now, if you're a student enough, you can read into it and say, well, yeah, these are what these people are. If you So if I had a role model, all right, it might be Andrew Ridgely of, of Wham. <laughs> right, Wham, do you remember Wham from the mid-1980s? It consists of uh, George Michael and Andrew Ridgely. 
and there's a new Netflix documentary about uh, Wham. And I, I like what Andrew Ridgely did. He recognized that uh, George Michael was overwhelmingly the most talented, and he recognized that if Wham wanted to have hits, that they would, they would come from George Michael. And so he's happy to let the pop star life go. He's happy to recognize that you know, being a pop star is not his fate. I mean, how many other artists or you know, gurus or YouTube personalities, right, being one half of one of the biggest bands in the world after achieving all sorts of worldwide number one hits, selling more than 30 million records, would just give up so willingly without bitterness or resentment. So as far as pop star ego, Andrew, Andrew Ridgely never had it. So early on, he had some discomfort about handing all songwriting duties over to George Michael, but he also accepts it logically. If he wants hits, the better songwriter writes. And so by the end of Wham!, he's met with endless quips over his redundant role in the band from interviewers like Terry Wogan and Paula Yates, and he just laughs them off. At his final farewell concert at Wembley in 1986, he walks off humbly. I was happy for my friend. He stood on the cusp of greatness, but I didn't know what being... George Michael truly meant. So Andrew Ridgely just walked away from stardom, you know, recognizing that George Michael was truly the star of Wham. And uh, that shows a great deal of maturity. You read enough history, it becomes very clear from the beginning what these people are. And one of the things that I was always charged with doing when I was an undergraduate and graduate student by good professors was figuring out who these people were that were writing these books. For example, if you know Eric Foner is a communist, which he is, you're going to understand that everything he writes comes with a communist worldview. There's only one book that he's ever produced that doesn't have that worldview, and that's his Free Soil, Free Labor, Free Men, and that's because Eugene Genovese had a heavy hand in that particular book. Now, Genovese was also a communist, but Genovese, when that book was produced, but Genovese was um, a bit different in that he was uh, certainly a communist in, in the 1970s, but he was interested more in uh, a non-ideological history. He was honest in many ways. And so that particular book is at least honest. So, and I will say Foner's the second founding is, is honest in what happened during Reconstruction. I mean, there are things about Eric Foner where he's right, okay? But you know when you read Eric Foner what you're getting. Um, and that's the important thing. You know, for example, when you read Forrest McDonald what you're getting. He's a Hamiltonian. But at least he was honest when he wrote his book on Jefferson. I mean, uh, Forrest McDonald is a conservative historian. You know what you're getting. This is the where understanding who these historians are makes sense. And for the 1776 Project to say it's nonpartisan, it's a joke. That's a joke. Uh, it, you don't have objective history. There's a, a book by a man named Novick entitled That Noble Dream. Uh, I'm looking for a, a subtitle, something like this. Yeah, Peter Novick about uh, objectivity in history. Came, book came out in 1988. Amazing book. Hey everybody, saying, hello what from does sunny Colorado. Today we're going to talk say. about France. Uh, there have been a number of protests and a number of schools and police officers have been burned in the last couple of days. The triggering event is the police killed a kid. Um, I want to say it was like 15, 17, something like that. And so there's been this spontaneous uprising of violence. We haven't seen activity like this since 2005. Back then, similar cause, uh, police killed a couple of kids that were hiding from the police, and it triggered riots that lasted several weeks. Uh, Too soon to know if this is... I know, I know. You want a cartoon version of reality. Well, I'm going to give you three minutes of a cartoon version of reality. It's going to be one of those sort of explosive, protracted events, but it's worth considering because France is not like a lot of other places. Now, here in the United States... We obviously have a checkered past uh, and a checkered present when it comes to issues of race, and it's part of the conversation all the time. And there are members of a number of minorities that are represented in governments at all levels, especially the national level. We've even had a uh, black president. Uh, That is not the situation in France. In France, uh, they... So what did having a black president do for black Americans? Right, Uh, are black Americans better off for having had a, a black president? And if so, how so? Right, it's not like France's race problems are unique or America's race problems are unique. These problems are reproduced everywhere you go in the world that have these racial combinations. They made the decision back after the revolution that ethnic conflict was so extreme that they had to redefine what the term French means. So it didn't matter if you were Catalan or Basque or from Paris or Marseille or Alsatian, it didn't matter. Everyone was French now. And all of the very- Yeah, just imagine if uh, France got an urban youth as president, that would solve so many of these problems, right? Various groups that had been part of a series of civil wars and disturbances in France going back a millennium, all of a sudden were considered all of the same family. 
And in the modern age, what that means is it's illegal, uh, unconstitutional even, to collect ethnic data on the French population. And if everyone was just Basque or Catalan or French or Alsatian, that might be okay. But that is not the France of today. As part of the colonial legacy, a number of people from their former colonies have moved to the mainland France, metropolitan France, and even have French citizenship. In fact, in some cases, their great-great-grandparents had French citizenship. So these are not people who arrived recently. But because it's illegal, unconstitutional, to collect any sort of racial data, they exist as a sort of second class that is, from the American term, almost undocumented because of the racism that exists in all societies. So in the case of France, they don't even know how big the racial problem is. It's probably about 15% of the population is non-ethnic French. Uh, gosh, I, I thought if you simply didn't collect uh, racial statistics, you wouldn't have racial problems. But legally French. Uh, and that has institutionalized the racism in a way that we have a really hard time processing here in the United States. In many cases, it's more similar to what they've got in Brazil. You've got an urban center where the ethnic French live that is relatively well off. And then you've got a ring of suburbs that is more akin to slums where most of the non-ethnic French who are still French citizens live. And because the French can't even do the first step of collecting data in order to get a good grip on what the size of the issue is, it's really hard for the government to apportion resources outside of law enforcement. So in many ways, parts of France, even in their major cities, resemble a little bit of armed camps. And that makes it very easy for uh, violence to erupt because it's, it's not a... Well, wait a second. Aren't there similar armed camps wherever you have these racial combinations anywhere you go in the world? You cannot have civilization without walls. All right? Either you have natural walls such as mountains or oceans, or you have to put up you know, artificial walls to maintain civilization. When Rome's walls fell and the barbarians plundered, right, Roman civilization came to an end big reach for people who are the subject of living in the armed camps to rebel against the people who are supposedly providing law and order. Now, for those of you who know my work, you know that I'm very bullish on France in the long run. They never bet their economic, much less their political system, on globalization, and they never integrated their economy into the European Union. They've always seen themselves as a step apart, and that means that they've sacrificed a lot of efficiencies and a lot of the reach they could have gotten under the globalized era in order to maintain a more nationally oriented economic... So France has about the highest percentage of government spending of any major first world country of which I'm aware. And yet uh, life in France, for, for all its problems, for most of its citizens, is still pretty good. Like many Americans are amazed at the quality of life in, in France when they visit system that comes at a big cost but it does mean as globalization breaks down that the french don't have that far to fall because if the eu were to dissolve tomorrow and freedom of the seas would to cease to exist next week the french economic system is largely in-house they're a massive producer and exporter of agricultural products they've got energy nearby in both the north sea and in northwest africa uh, there are several countries removed from the ukraine war and what's going on with the russians and their primary economic competitor is also their primary political partner in the current environment, and that is Germany. And unlike the French, the Germans have gone whole hog on globalization to the point that we're already seeing massive problems there when it comes to exposure to the Chinese systems or the Russian systems or whatever. The French have none of that. And then finally, the French demographic is strong because there's a neonatal sort of policy set that encourages people to have kids in large numbers, giving France the healthiest demographic structure in the world outside of New Zealand. And uh... okay, Mark Levin has a new book, and he's a really Mark bad Levin. historian. I'll talk about that on this episode of The Brian McClanahan Show. I think there is an American okay. conservative tradition, but... It's not what uh, people think it is. It's certainly not Abraham Lincoln. And we'll talk more about Lincoln this week, too, but it's not Abraham Lincoln. No. If that's conservative, well, we're doomed. Because all you're doing is conserving the revolution of the 1860s, which, by the way, is ongoing. I mentioned it yesterday. I mean, this is what these people want. In the email I sent out yesterday, if you're on the email list, you would have gotten it. There were two articles back to back, you know, two days apart, actually one, one day apart, two consecutive days from the Daily Beast. One saying that Juneteenth should not be a national holiday. One saying it's a national holiday because it's a day to talk about getting the Confederacy. I mean, nobody even knows what this thing is. But remember, it was Republicans who were all on board for having Juneteenth be a holiday. Why? Well, because this is championing Republicans. You see, these people live in this very stupid R versus D world. And again, that's red meat for most people walking around thinking, well, if we just get the Democrats, everything's going to be all right. What are you going to give them? Republicans? The stupid party? The morons that wouldn't vote to, uh, to uh, maintain traditional American society if they wanted to? I mean, we see it all the time. There are a few good Republicans that will vote to do the right thing. But for the most part, when, when the masses go out, American people in the states go out and they vote Republican, unless you're talking about state and local elections, you're voting for a bunch of establishment hacks. And Mark Levin really is showcases the mental illness in some ways that is the establishment. And I'll talk about at the beginning. I mean, I've made fun of Democrats for doing this exact same thing that Mark Levin talks about at the beginning of this monologue. It's really stupid. So let me get into it. I'm just going to read you, I'm not going to read Jeff Poor's little introduction to it, but just read you what Mark Levin had to say about this. He says, I really believe in fate, and I believe God gives us a path to follow, and hopefully we can find that path and follow it, and some people do. Okay, well, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that statement. All right, I mean, that's, that's vanilla. Some people are athletes, some people are professors, some people make sure we're fed. They're farmers, they're truck drivers, you name it. <laughs> wow, what deep insight, Levin. Me, for me, the path apparently is this. What's this? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I spend my weekends and my nights and early mornings doing this. 
getting these bags under my eyes. I don't sleep a lot. I just don't. Things worry me. Things concern me. Now, think about Yeah, if you're falling asleep because uh, you can't sleep because of what's going on in the world, there's something wrong with you because your ability to shape what goes on in the world is severely limited. And so you have to you have to have a vastly exaggerated sense of your own importance, right, to to lose sleep over the you know the fate of the nation. Why would you lose sleep over something you can't control, something that's far more complex than you can even possibly comprehend? About what's going on here. Now, so he's saying that my job is to come out here and talk to you about things that worry me and things that concern me. And of course, if you watch the video behind Levin, you have Abraham Lincoln. Now, you can put any Democrat there and they'd have Abraham Lincoln behind him too. What's the difference? You see? Uh, in fact, they would, they'd love Abraham Lincoln because Abraham Lincoln began the revolution. He began the left-wing revolution we're seeing. Now, of course, the Republicans of the 1860s wouldn't have agreed with a lot of what the left does. But they began the revolution. They started the process. That's why I said, even before that, you want to go back to someone who really began the revolution before that, it will be Alexander Hamilton. But those people, the centralizers, began the revolution we're seeing now. And it opened the door to all the things that we are experiencing in modern American society from the center. Now, So Brian McClanahan is a big believer in federalism. Like, devolve as much power as possible to the states. Oh, this doesn't happen everywhere else. But when you start looking at extreme centralization, which is what all these people were, then you get the culture war on steroids because the states can't do anything about it. The real conservative bulwarks in America were the states. And I use this quote over and over again. Yeah, so the reason that America doesn't have the level of social welfare spending that other first world nations have is largely because America is a federalist society and a racially divided society. And Americans, by and large, don't want to vote for social welfare spending for groups who are not them. John C. Calhoun. I'm a conservative, and because I'm a conservative, I'm a states' rights man. Calhoun knew what was going on. The centralizers, those in New England, who had a whole different agenda, and it wasn't just about slavery, had a whole different agenda than what they had in the rest of the United States, were trying to use nationalism as cover for real sectionalism. That's what George Washington talked about over and over again. And the next class of McClanahan Academy, in fact, is going to be reading George Washington. I'm really excited about this class because uh, Washington is so important to understand. But Washington talked about factionalism over and over again in subtle ways. Lincoln was a factionalist from the beginning. He wasn't concerned about the union for all. He was concerned about the union for his party, for his faction. That's not real nationalism. And what all these people are doing now, whether it's Levin talking about the right or the Democrats on the left or the Republicans on the right, whatever, if they're really on the right, they're interested in their own faction. They're not interested in union for all. A union for all would be so limited in power that the states would control all of the things that we often wring our hands over, that Mike Levin stays up nights, or Mark Levin, I'm sorry, stays up nights worrying about his wife. will tell you that I have a pad next to my bed. I take notes about certain things that are going on in the country. So what? Does that make you special? It actually makes you mentally insane. To put a notepad next to your bed to write down things that worry you about the country? I mean, come on. There are other things, more important things to worry about than that. And I think- Well, I, I do sleep within a few, a few feet of a notepad. I often do get up in the night and uh, jot down notes of things I want to talk about on a show. Or I'll, as I go through the day, I'll jot down notes and put them in my pocket of things I want to talk about. Most Americans don't leave a notepad by their, bed, by their bed worrying about what happens in California if they don't live there, or worrying about what happens in Massachusetts. So don't worry, frankly, unless you're a Yankee, you don't worry about what happens anywhere else in your, but except in your state and your community. Now, I can worry about those things, but more importantly, I'd worry about my family first, what's happening there, not all this other stuff. People should write, if they have a notepad to worry about things, write down things that are important to you and your family. And, you know, you, you are what you take in and consume, and this is something that, you know, people don't realize, but when all you do is consume negativity, that's what you become. People don't take the time to go around and see positive things in the world, and there's a lot out there for it. There's a lot of beautiful things in this world that people just don't pay attention to. You want to have an uplifting time? Put a hummingbird feeder out your window and make your own hummingbird food if you live anywhere near woods and you're going to have hummingbirds. And if you watch hummingbirds, it's beautiful. Or a bird feeder, any kind of bird feeder. Plant some flowers. Go see the ocean. These are things that are really relaxing and they ground you. There's beautiful things in this world. And Mark Levin just wrings his hands. Oh no, what am I going to worry about? <laughs> I mean, I've talked about this before, how the left does this. This is, it's, this is, shows you that Mark Levin really is, in many ways, just another form of the left. They're two sides of the same coin. It's okay to have an eye on what's happening and know what's going on, but when you worry about things you can't control, that's just ridiculous. That's mental illness when you worry about things you can't control. But this is his job, he says, to tell you all these things, all the negativity. And of course, it's the Democrats at the root of all this. He gets into that. His next... So I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Forty, how did you produce such an amazing show yesterday? The wit, the wisdom, the profundity. Well, it, it came from these little post-it notes that I stuck in my pocket and uh, carried around with me all day. And then 
these notes just exploded through the force of my personality around uh, 6, 10 p.m. last night. Line. I am a voracious reader of his mostly history. Well, I don't know what history he's reading, but anyways, I'll get into that in a minute. I'm trying to figure out what's taking place. Who's responsible for that? For what? And that's all well and good, but if I can't communicate that to you, if I don't have a platform like this or radio or books, then really it is all very interesting, but what's the point? Now, in some ways, he's correct about that, but there is a point to this. He's saying if he doesn't have a national, quote-unquote, radio program or television show or writing a book, then what's the point in doing it? Well, there's lots of things. See, this is the inverse of how people should actually be thinking about these things. If you read this stuff, what's the point? You tell your family, or if they don't want to hear it, you go get involved in your school board, in your, uh, in your county council or city council. You go to your civics meetings, go to your church, you talk to people there. You know how you change all this stuff? You tell people about things there. And as you do that, more and more people will come around to what's really going on. I had a friend of mine tell me uh, yesterday, in fact, we were talking about something. He said, you know, uh, I was at a, he, he was giving a talk to a group and uh, he said he, he made a point about, you know, what you need to do is go out and, and uh, work in your school boards. And he said, these two little old ladies were sitting in the audience. She said, well, you know, yeah, our local city is the one that's responsible for our tax books. That's exactly right. But Mark Levin will tell you it has to happen from the Republican Party, from the good old GOP at the center. We need to get Joe Biden. It's all Joe Biden's fault. Joe Biden doesn't tell you what textbooks to use in your local school at all. There's none of that. You see, if you want to change things, you need to make Joe Biden as irrelevant as possible. In reality, you need to make Mark Levin as irrelevant as possible because he's a national voice. Right? So, I mean, I know people listen to this all over the, all over the United States, all over the world. But the fact is, um, what I try to tell you is go out and do things at the local and state level. Even if you're in another country, you can still make change there if you don't have a federal system. Or I know people listen to this in places they don't have our American political system, but you can still make changes. And it doesn't have to be from the top down. Just changing your, your town, making the culture better there, living a better life, being an example for people. That's a great thing. Uh, just starting to notice, uh, Fox News puts uh, a great deal of emphasis on the comely legs of its uh, female panelists. Okay, you're probably wondering, what does David French have to say about Christian nationalism and the, uh, the new right? Well, good evening. The right since 2016. Um, and just kind of give an explainer um, on the differences between the old right and the new right. And I think it's important because one of the things that I'm constantly shocked by, genuinely shocked, is the extent to which when I talk to my progressive friends, I'm in academia, so obviously the majority of my colleagues are very progressive, um, they really have no, no clue what the new right is. Um, you know, people in my parents' generation still think of conservatism as Reaganism. Yeah. So yeah, old right versus new right. A primer, please. Yeah, so here's basically a very short history of like the last 10 years. Sure. Because if we get too much into this, you'll find out that the new right is actually the old right. <laughs> and the old right was the new right at a certain point. So, Well, walk what, us through that. Yeah, so, so we'll go back to about 10 years ago, so ago. And when um, Mitt Romney was running for president, there was a pretty, you know, I would say a, a rigorously enforced consensus that there were three legs of the Republican stool that one of them was social conservatism. Republicans and conservatives are going to be pro-life. They were going to be for pro-religious, you know, they're going to be for religious liberty. The other stool, a leg of the stool, was going to be an, not truly economic libertarianism in the way that Cato Institute would envision it or the way Reason Magazine would envision it, but more limited government, less interference, in, government interference in the economy, less central planning, less command and control, more deregulation. And then the final leg of the stool was going to be, or was for years, a strong national defense with an emphasis on international alliances and forward engagement. And so that was Reaganism in a nutshell. And for a while, um, Reaganism not only won uh, the sort of internecine battles on the right, it won in a rout to such an extent that if you turned on Fox News in, say, 2010, 2011, 2012, people like, say, Sean Hannity would be angry at any, any deviation. That was what a rhino was back then. A rhino was if you knocked any one of those legs of the stool out. And a lot of the suspicion about Mitt Romney was that he really wasn't all on board with all three components, that he, yes, economic, Yes, uh, on the you know, forward deployed military and strong international alliances, but social conservatism, he was suspect. And so those three legs were the Republican Party and the conservative movement. There was an enormous amount of unanimity. And whenever you have a lot of unanimity, you get fossilization, you get groupthink, uh, a movement that is deprived of any real intellectual diversity can become stagnant. Mm -hmm. And so by 2015 or so, there was actually a lot of discontent on the right, um, that it just wasn't working, that this, this Reaganism was not right for the time. So here comes Donald Trump down the escalator, a, you know, an intellectual of populist bent. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> a man of singular personal ambition, okay, who didn't really necessarily have an ideology at all. Mm -hmm. If you remember back to 2015, 2016, I mean, he threw a bunch of stuff against the wall. He floated single-payer health care. He said that Planned Parenthood did many good things. He 
advocated ordering the military to commit war crimes. And the way, one of the ways that you would talk about Trump and his interaction with his audience is they were drawn to him attitudinally. They appreciated his combat combativeness, but there was no there there as far as an ideology. And so he would kind of use his audience actually as a, a giant focus group, his rally audience. And what they would really cheer for, he'd double down on that. And what they didn't love so much, he'd leave that aside. But, you know, so Trump was very, very good, quite obviously, at capturing a crowd. What he was not so good at was creating any kind of intellectual movement at all. Well, for a lot of people who had been discontent with the state of conservatism, that was a giant opportunity. You could. Okay, this is how Christopher Caldwell concludes his terrific 2020 book, The Age of Entitlement. In June 2015, with the presidential election heating up, right, he never mentions Donald Trump explicitly in this book. But in June 2015, with the presidential election heating up, talk show host Bill Maher invited a handful of journalists to discuss the future of American politics. A dozen Republicans well-respected within the party were seeking the nomination. Bill Maher asked one of his guests, the conservative journalist Ann Coulter, which candidate had the best chance of winning the general election. Her reply was surprising. She didn't think any of them would get the nomination. A self-promoting New York real estate developer, however, had announced his candidacy three days before, appearing in a Manhattan office building he pretended to own, making a few off-the-cuff sounding remarks about Mexican immigration, how great America could be, and eliciting the unanimous ridicule of the press corps. Coulter sternly spoke his name. Her fellow panelists seemed to think she was cracking a joke. They twisted their faces into histrionic expressions of puzzlement to play along. The studio audience roared with laughter. That's the end of his book, The Age of Entitlement. Fill the empty vessel. And so what a lot of people started to do was fill the empty vessel with actually something that was very much of the old right, the older right, older than Reaganism. So this is going to be America first. A not, it's not fair to call it isolationism, but a more isolationist foreign policy, which is an old strain of the right. You're going to fill it with economic populism, protectionism, et cetera, which is, again, an old strain of the right. And then you're going to preserve the social conservatism, but with more of an emphasis on state power than perhaps the old, that, that Reagan social conservatism did. So I grew up in the Reagan social conservatism era where the emphasis was on religious liberty. In other words, give churches freedom, give people of faith freedom, and then with our words and with our actions and with the examples of our lives, we can start to change the United States and we can sort of uh, reintroduce or introduce or maintain religious influence on the United States of America. But the social conservatism of the Trump era became more authoritarian, more centered around state power. And, but all of that's old. All of that is what you would call paleo-conservatism in a way. So what, was, what made it new wasn't so much the ideology as the temperament, as the disposition. So it was tying a lot of older conservative ideas to Donald, the personality and the character of Donald Trump. So that the movement became to, and again, at no point did Trump say, I agree intellectually. This is the intellectually sounder approach. Um, they poured this into his movement and then imitated and began to adopt his disposition. So the new right, if the old right had an a ideological axis and a temperamental axis, it would be the Reagan ideology, the three stools, and then a temperamental approach very much like that of Ronald Reagan, of George H.W. Bush, of George W. Bush. People who, for lack of a better term, could be hard-nosed political fighters, but were also known as Hello, as I'm Ann Coulter, welcome. Right. And so what Trump did is he said, no to that, no to that. You don't need to be a good guy. In fact, being a good guy could be a real problem because good guys are suckers. And so what you began to see was a new right that adopted an ideology of the paleo right and the disposition of Donald Trump. And so the new right is characterized by the older right ideology and the Trumpist disposition so that it is very, very combative and pugilistic online. It is very, very. OK, let's uh, get a little here from Ann Coulter talking with Ryan Gadot. <laughs> to you all day because, well, about many things all week, um, because we have DeSantis's new immigration plan or his campaign immigration. What do you think? I mean, it was it was great. I mean, it was everything I thought it was going to be, weirdly enough. Like, it's strange. Remember when Trump um, like unveiled the white paper and it was so much better than I had ever expected because we never seen something that good before. Um, with DeSantis, I kind of always knew he was going to be so good. So I read and I was like, okay, good. He hit this part. He hit this part. And it was more of a, did he miss anything? I was like, okay, he didn't miss anything. So that's great. Um, and I think that it was strong. I think that it was a really, really important. I think that was great for legal immigration. I want his legal immigration white paper now more that's than anything. That'll be, that'll be Christmas in July when the, when the legal immigration. <laughs> well, we know he's good on legal immigration. I was thinking the same thing. What was so... Um, what was so revolutionary about Trump's immigration plan is, as you say, 
no candidate had ever, ever said it before. That was the biggest thing. Um, now we know it's popular. Now a lot of Republicans will pretend to run on many of those immigration policies. And the other thing that was kind of stunning about about Trump's immigration plan, none of which he fulfilled. Um, we have to have a, a sober, responsible, smart adult to do that. Um, was was he? He didn't really understand the issues. <laughs> and so when he talked about it, it was just BS and bluster. And then he comes out with this immigration plan that obviously he never read and never understood himself. But man, it was good. Right. I love, I mean, my favorite thing right now that the campaign, the Trump campaign's response is because, well, we built a wall. Well, <laughs> if that's true, where is it? Like, right. where is this wall that somehow 5 million illegals just crossed in the last two and a half years? There is no wall. What are you talking? First of all, it's a fence. It's not a wall that you built. Right. Secondly, right. you upgraded the wall that was there. And thirdly, it was 56 miles, 58 miles, 60 miles, whatever the case is. You didn't build a wall. Yes. Yes, and, it's funny you know, how the thing that lying. frustrates me. And I'm yeah, mm -hmm. and, and and says he said on CNN, and he said it on two other interviews. He said I completed the wall. You completed the. What are you? What is anyone seeing that I am not seeing? And it's like that conversation you had with Pedro Gonzalez last week, where he said it's not like there wasn't a Trump administration ringing the arms of Republicans to get things done because they got the crime bill done. They just never cared about this wall, and they never cared immigration. And that's the thing that's so frustrating. So I really hope. I mean, DeSantis really has to kick his campaign into the next year of the campaign and really start, I think, calling Trump out by name for saying certain things. I think that, I think DeSantis has to sit there and say, Donald Trump did not complete a border wall, point blank. You could be right. I, I, I want to